uh, he was the one who helped actually drafted our new MA, MFA in uh, literature, creative writing, and social justice. And so he's, he's back now. I hope that the students in the program will introduce themselves to him afterwards so that you know, he can see what, you know, who's, who's come to uh, join the program that he created. So Chaim Tarara is the author of five books, um, four poetry, one um, children's book. And this is the, the most recent one, Something Sinister. It was just published last week. And so uh, I want to welcome him back to our Lady Lake. Hi, I'm going to see if I can, um, I don't want to stand behind you, but can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, so when I left, when I left here two years ago, I, I tried to hold back the tears. I, I failed a little bit. Um, it was uh, uh, hard to leave. Uh, wonderful people that I worked with, uh, but they are my friends and, and uh, still uh, think of them, even though it's been a couple of years since I've left. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you, Yvette, uh, everyone else in the program. Um, I see a, a few familiar faces. Thank you for being here. So let, let me start with the readings. I'm going to read a, some new poems and then poems from the book. I, I want a couple of the poems I'm going to read tonight are not mine, and I thought I'd start with a poem. Um, every once in a while, I hope everyone experiences this, you come across a poem that just slays you. And this is one of them. It did so for me. Uh, this is a poem by Mahmoud Darvish. It was translated by a, a good friend of mine who lives in Houston. It's a poet as well, and Fadi Buddha. And the, the poem is titled The House Murdered. In one minute, the whole life of a house ends. The house murdered is also mass murder, even if vacant of its residence. It is a mass grave for the basic elements needed to construct a building for meaning, or for an insignificant poem in a time of war. The house murdered is the amputation of things from their relations and from the names of emotions, and it is tragedy's need to guide eloquence to contemplate the life of a thing. In each thing, there's a being that aches, the memory of fingers, of a scent, of an image. And houses get murdered just as their residents get murdered. And as the memory of things get murdered, wood, stone, glass, iron, cement, they all scatter in fragments like beams. And cotton, silk, linen, notepads, books, all are torn like words whose owners were not given time to speak. And the plates, Spoons, toys, records, faucets, pipes, door handles, and the fridge, the washer, the vases, jars of olives and pickles and canned foods all break as their owners broke. And the two whites, salt and sugar, are pulverized. And also the spices, the matchboxes, the pills, and oral contraceptives elixirs, garlic braids, onions, tomatoes, dried okra, rice and lentils, as happens with the residents. And the lease contract, the marriage and birth certificates, the utility bills, identity cards, passports, love letters, all torn to shreds like the hearts of their owners. And the pictures fly, the toothbrushes, hair combs, makeup accessories, shoes, underwear, sheets, towels, like family, family secrets hung in public in ruin. All these things are the memories of people who were emptied of things, and the memories of things that were emptied of people. All end in one minute. Our things die like us, but they don't get buried with us. Uh, 
Thanks. Amen. Um, this is a, a long title. Elegy with apples, pomegranates, bees, butterflies, thorn bushes, oak, pine, warblers, crows, ants, and worms. <laughs> the trees alongside the fence bear fruit. The limbs and leaves speeches to you and me. They promise to give the world back to itself. The apple apologizes for those whose hearts bear too much zest for heaven. A pomegranate for the change that did not come soon enough. Every seed is a heart, every heart a minefield, and the bees and butterflies swarm the flowers on its grave. The thorn bushes instruct us to tell our sons and daughters who carry sticks and stones to mend their ways. The oak tree says to eat only fruits and vegetables. The pine says to eat all the stirring things. My neighbor left a long time ago and did not hear any of this. In a big country, the leader warns the leader of a small country there must be change else. Birds are the same way, coming and going, wobbling thin branches. The warblers express pain. The crows regret. Or is it the other way around? The mantra today is the same as yesterday. We must become different. The plants must, the animals, and the ants and worms, just like the car makers, the soap makers before them, and the manufacturers of rubber, and the sellers of tea, tobacco, and salt. Such an ancient habit, making ourselves new. My neighbor looks like my mother, who left a long time ago and did not hear any of this. Just for a minute, give her back to me. Before she died, kneeling in the dirt under the sun, calling me darling in Arabic, which no one has since. Um, in, in, this next poem is called 1979, and in that year I was seven, six months. My father and I often drove together in our cars, in his car, and uh, this is one of those times. Around the same time, if it's not clear for those who may or may not have been around at that time, uh, there was the uh, oil crisis. It's very short poem, but it deals with that. 1979. If you met my father, I should say, so, uh, so he, he's a really charming man, um, but he is uh, absolutely crazy. <laughs> Probably what makes him charming to people who are not his son. <laughs> but, um, and this, it really comes through. 1979. We were stopped at a red light. I was in the passenger seat, and a guy crossing the street looked at the Buick, then at us, flipped us the middle finger and said, go home, camel jockeys. However hard I try, I can't remember if then and there what the guy said made any difference to me. It was said, what did I know about a crisis? As for the guy, before the light turned green, my father floored the pedal and ran him over. Oh. <laughs> 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 so 
this poem has a title that is uh, tentative. It's a, a relatively new poem. Um, I don't, I don't know if I'm sticking with the title, but we'll see. It's a personal political poem. And um, I just let me do this. I, I just uh, first I mentioned earlier, Fatty. I'm not calling him right now, but um, <laughs> he said something quite wonderful in an interview. That I was. Uh, so am I going to find this? Um, I sent it to myself. It was, um, let me tell you. This is, let me read you something Fatty said. I'll just preface this the poem. He says, I don't, he was asked a question about writing political poems. So I'm going to a couple of years ago. He says, I don't know what political poetry is, unless it's bad poetry, propagandist or apologist for injustice. Other than that, it's not political. Rather, it's dignified, humanizing. I don't feel a responsibility to write political poems. I feel a compulsion to address that line where the universal is the personal and the personal the universal. Being Palestinian almost becomes another's <coughs> question of me, and certainly not mine of myself. That question is in many ways one of power rewriting the other. Thus, what is called political poetry for me is to humanize the other without stripping them from the right to speak their narrative or imposing on them my narcissistic projections as a righteous one. I thought of this and look, looked it up again because I, I think Fanny is right in this regard. So um, maybe the title makes sense, we'll see. Political, personal political poem. Around midnight, I stalled outside a police station. The cops told me to keep walking. A mile later, the gas station attendant talked and talked. He asked if I recognized him. He said we knew each other when we were young. He'd been to the house I grew up in. His father loved my father. His mother loved my mother. He said he was sorry about what happened to he said, we're all dying, but we should get to grow old. And just like that, should it be how life ends. He said he was at the funeral. He said seeing me carry the casket made him imagine one day doing the same. I said it was late. I said I needed to get back. The cops were going to tow my car. He showed me a newspaper and said he was the guy who pulled a drowning girl from a crowded pool. He pointed to the mayor shaking his hand. He said the mayor graduated from his high school and was the kind of guy who'd jab his finger at your chest and say, you don't look like a Sam. No wonder he hates us, he said. He gave me free gas. He said there was something better out there. He knew there was, for him, for me. I told him it was true. He didn't look like a Sam. So I want to read one more poem uh, by someone else, um, preface to uh, a poem of mine. Um, uh, I just, I just I, I had an interview published, and one of the questions asked was if I could you know, steal another writer's work, who would it be? I limited it to five people whose work I would steal, and many, many more. But the, the first person I mentioned was the, the late poet Philip Levine, who died not long ago. Um, I was supposed to be a doctor. I was three years into, into pre med, uh, in the, into my pre med curriculum. I, I was in a chemistry lab waiting for I don't know what to do what. <laughs> I don't remember. And I, I walked over to the bookstore and I reached a, a, a collection of poems and I, I, and I read Philip Levine and I decided in that moment uh, to the horror of my parents that I was going to do that. I was going to write poems. This was what I read was astounding. It was amazing. And, um, uh, I don't remember if it was this poem. I think it was another, but I, I picked up this collection of Levine's title, They Feed, They Lie. And it just is one of those works that knocked me over. So I'd like to read you the title poem. 
and, um, and then read you a poem I read with you. He was a really kind man. I, I'd written him as a young writer uh, in Detroit. He was splitting his time between New York and Fresno. He was so kind in his letters. And then he was teaching at NYU when I moved to New York City. I was in my early 20s. And I, I went up to the English department where he was teaching. The elevator door opened. He was standing there. I said, hi. And he came to say hello to you. And he asked me my name. He said, oh, yeah, come on in. Three hours he talked to me. Three hours, total stranger. It was really remarkable. So uh, this is Philip Levine's They Feed, They Lie. Out of burlap sacks, out of bearing butter, out of black bean and wet slate bread, out of the acids of rage, the candor of tar, out of creosote, gasoline, drive shafts, wooden dollies, they lie and grow. Out of the gray hills of industrial barns, out of rain, out of bus ride, West Virginia to kiss my ass, out of buried aunties, mothers hardening like pounded stumps, out of stumps, out of the bones as need to sharpen and the muscles need to stretch, they lie and grow. Earth is eating trees, fence posts, gutted cars. Earth is calling in her little ones. Come home, come home. From pig balls, from the ferocity of pig driven to holiness, from the furred ear and the full jowl come the repose of the hung belly, from the purpose they lie and grow. From the sweet glues of the trotters come the sweet kinks of the fist, from the flower of the hams, the thorax of caves, from bow down come rise up. Come they lion from the reeds of shovels, the grained arm that pulls the hands, they lie and grow. From my five arms and all my hands, from all my white sins forgiven, they feed. From my car passing under the stars, they lie in. From my children inherit. From the oak turned to a wall, they lie in. From they sack and they belly opened, and all that was hidden, burning on the oil-stained earth, they feed, they lie in, and he comes. Here's a poem titled My father never asked me why I gave up becoming a doctor to be a poet. I would have told him because of a poem by Levine about a boy and girl on Belle Isle taking off their clothes and walking hand in hand <coughs> into the filthiest river I knew, the Detroit River. The poem was beautiful, but I kept my mouth shut about it, and Levine kept my mouth shut about it and Levine, sure he'd asked only if the poet was a Jew. He only ever talked to one Jew, the owner of a furniture shop by the Rouge, and only to haggle over the price of a sofa or dining set he wasn't planning on buying. He could have said a lot that I might have listened to. Poems won't pay bills, and the companies hiring don't give a shit about all the poems written in English, or Arabic, or any language. He'd never read a poem of mine, and didn't bother to ask if anyone in the world thought they were any good. He might have pointed out how poor and destitute so many poets died, but he did none of this. I told him I was going to be a poet regardless of failure, and he put a gun to my head and said, no. I was 19. That was 23 years ago, and today the Levine died. So let me um, So the, the book is called Something Sinister for a reason. So I, I, I've set you up with the mood. And it's going there. It's going to stay there. Um, I'll try to interject every now and then something that my wife brings up. <laughs> mood radishes. So, uh, this is, my wife and I now have a cat and two beautiful little boys. At one point, we had three dogs. 
an indoor cat, two porch cats, one of which had three more cats, and we had to keep them in a room for about three months so we could give them away so we didn't have more. We had a lot of animals. <laughs> and and um, my wife keeps rescuing them. And, um, so and, and animals are important in our lives very much so. This is a, a poem called, with, well, uh, there's a few poems here with animals and dogs in particular. This is called Starved Dogs Eating Snow. <clears throat> in a field without tracks, a pack of starved dogs eating snow, all mutts with knobs of spine and sharp protruding ribs. I asked the dogs, how did you get here? Maybe they'd been there so long the falling snow gradually filled up their footprints, a small triumph of gravity over the diminishing weight of their bodies. They kept to feed, they kept to their feeding as if snow were chickens. I could not tell the difference between a salivating dog or a dog with melted snow dripping from its muzzle. In the morning I was grateful the dogs in the dream did not bark light or look up. The day before, coming home, I drove past the dog lying on its stomach in the middle of the road, gasping for air. And from its mouth gurgled the white foam of thirst mixed with red. Unease argued in my gut over the dignity of a dog. And if it weren't mine, what would I do? And shouldn't the man or woman who ran over the dog and not me be asking these questions? A while later, I drove back, but someone by then had carried the dog to the curb and covered it with a towel. The flies and fleas were eager. It was summer, muggy, and hot. Um, this is a poem called uh, What is Mine? Um, it's a, another poem about um, my mother. And um, I, this poem is for Naomi. What we come up against, what we know, what we've seen and heard, is like a tree. Once cut down into so many boards, or mulched, or burned, it's no longer a tree. It becomes a house, a table, or paper, or firewood. It's like that. To know something is for it to become something else. When I was a boy, my mother bought me new clothes, even as the bills piled up and the car broke down. She saved and sacrificed for all those shoes and shirts and slacks. She loved us like a piece of fruit loves to be eaten. Years after she died, I found out she was arrested for shoplifting. I wondered then about my father's rage, which came on like a fever, and how he must have begged her to stop, and people knowing and talking and the shame of it all, how that hunger that always returned every time I ruined a shirt with a stain or scuffed a pair of shoes or grew an inch. My mother was a thief. I didn't know that about her, but now I do. With experience, it's like this. Once it's yours, there's no giving it back. Past the smokestacks looming on the river and the rivers of restless rush hour traffic, I drove north to where the roads were unmapped and the trees did not line up in rows one after the other. I went to get away and to forget, but as it turned out, I broke a sweat, splitting and stacking logs behind the cabin. And like flickering street lamps, the upturned leaves groaned 
What is the sound of cars and trucks churning uninterrupted down an interstate, if not that of a stream in the woods? For hours on end, I watched ants in their lines of work and stared at grass twitch. Bit by bit, I grew tired of the world as it was there, doing everything and nothing all at once, and so decided on a drive around the lake. But backing up, distracted, the radio interrupting the clamor of cicadas with rumors of a truce and the murders preceding it, I whacked the rear bumper into a sapling, nearly crushing it. I stepped around the tree, only knee high, and ran my thumb along its limbs carefully, as if the slightest touch would cause it to fall apart. And then I looked up, and the trees spoke. Look here, they said. We will outlast you all. We belong here more than you. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, where's Ito? This is for you, Ito. The poem's that this is called Something's Finished Around, and there's no implication about that <laughs> being <laughs> part of your personality. <laughs> uh, Ito's home was my home for two years here in San Antonio. I think I wrote a good deal of this poem here. It's amazing how the, the subject of this poem, I think, is unfortunately uh, maybe even more relevant today um, than, than it was when I wrote it, and it has been for decades. Something sinister going on. Um, I'm one guy sitting in a chair. You're a bunch of guys on the street, screaming, chanting, death to this and death to that. You're always so angry. You should try being calm, letting go. Own a pet. Quit caffeine. I don't smoke. Maybe you should be more like me. A person like me enjoys bacon, pork chops, corned beef, hash, eggs over easy, french fries, woodwork, girls in bikinis, Netflix, <laughs> instant coupons, running, camping, coney dogs, souvenir coffee mugs, Cable survivor shows, oak trees, rivers, the country, family reunions in Corpus Christi, the Detroit Lions, voting, complaining about voting, <laughs> deep fried Oreo cookies, rodeo, state fairs, baseball, and apple pie. I know, I know how American of me. It's true. I can stand to lose five pounds. I can turn off the war. I can afford to be peaceful. Did I tell you about my grandfather who died from the same bombs you're raising your fists at? You know, my father's piece of sky is in the same time zone as yours. Something's happening. I can feel it. Can you feel it? It's like two drops of water coming together and then the flood. Like seeing through the right eye and then the left, back and forth, one eye, then the other. A headache, really, if you try. It is 5.35. Outside my window, a tree is blossoming. Maybe this is why I want to compare you with birds. Except seeing you, I do not think nightingales or ruby-throated hummingbirds. Who ever heard of such a thing, turning grown men into birds? You're restless like bees. I'm restless. You're restless. We're one and the same. We're getting close, at least. Let me be clear about what is happening. I'm here, you're there, the trees are blossoming, red birds flash past my window. I can't help but think of fire. I see a mob, men holding matches to the trunks of trees, a row of fire ants marching past. A burning tree, you know, is like a redhead on fire, except a tree does not scream, and even trees without leaves survive. It's midnight and all the trees are gone. This is mayhem. You're making it impossible for me to live. You want to take this outside? 
I didn't think so. Cowards, a lot of you, flying airplanes into buildings, bunch of yellow bellies. My wife says, I spend too much time talking to myself. Oh great, now I've become you and you me. What are we now if not the birds and the bees in the trees? Something sinister is going on. Listen, a fire speaks to a tree. The flame is patient. It loves the tree to death. more poems. Mother boiling lentils in a pot while he watched fight after fight, boxers pinned on the ropes, hobbling each other mercilessly, and hung on the wall where we ate breakfast, an autographed photo of Muhammad Ali. Oh, father, who worshipped him, and with a clenched fist pretended to be, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, and you loved being Muslim then even when you drank whiskey, even when you knocked down my mother again and again. Oh, prayer, oh, God of sun, God of moon, of cows and of thunder, of women, of bees, of ants and spiders, poets and calamity, God of the pen, of the fig, of the elephant. Taha Yasin Sad Kaf. God of my father, listen. He prayed. He prayed five times a day. And he was mean. The Taha Yasin Sat Kaf are um, the Quran contains surahs. You might call, I guess, chapters if you were to do that, uh, with these letters that precede the um, surahs as their titles. They're not to be mysterious because no one really knows what they stand for. Okay. Last one. I, I live in Houston, and um, I think maybe in some ways this happens here, yes, for sure. Um, when it rains really heavily, um, Houston just turns into rivers. Um, we have these viaducts. Um, it's underpasses and viaducts. They, they, they fly quickly. This um, poem centers around an event from a few years ago involving one of these underpasses. Um, this is a, it's a mother and daughter. The mother says, I'm afraid. The daughter says, I'm afraid. The mother says, my feet are cold. The daughter says, my feet are cold. The mother says, the car is sinking. The daughter says, yes, the car is sinking. The mother says, the water is heavy. And the daughter says, the water is very heavy. The mother says, I'm too young for this. The daughter says, I want to grow old. The mother says, I can see the sky. And the daughter says, I can also see the sky. How about the moon, the mother says. And the daughter says, I can see the moon. What else hurts you, the mother says. 
when the daughter says, what about you? I forgot to tell your father something, the mother says. And the daughter says, I forgot to tell my father something. The mother says, I do not want to die. I do not want to die, the daughter says. I wanted to be a good mother, the mother says. Sometimes you weren't, the daughter says. Sometimes you weren't a good daughter either, the mother says. And the daughter says, I want you to be good. I can hear my heart, she says. I can hear my heart, she says. I wish I loved Jesus, she says. And she says, I wish I loved Jesus. And she says, the thud is unbearable. She says, the thud is unbearable. What do you mean you wish you loved Jesus, she says. And she says, the water is dark. My clothes are getting heavier, she says. Heavier, she says, and heavier. She says, the water is up to my chin now. And she says, it is up to my chin too. What if this is the last thing I say to you, she says. And she says, what if this is the last thing I say to you? She says, I cannot hold on much longer. Please, she says, hold on longer. The water is at my mouth, she says, and she says, even if it is at your mouth, 